Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be invited to speak at the Aspire webinar about the big freeze. And the topic of my presentation uh, will cover the outcome of, of egg vitrification, egg freezing, and what we have achieved in the last uh, 50 years or so, um, what is the evidence. We'll, we'll show you uh, evidence and, and publications about how this has completely changed the way we practice and actually revolutionized uh, some areas of our work. In some lectures and some uh, papers and with some people that you, you will speak with, uh, you, you will see uh, this classical comparison on how relevant it was the introduction of vitrification. And in fact, uh, in 1965, it was the introduction of the birth control pill. And that completely was a, a, a big change for women, so they could separate their, their uh, sexual uh, life from their reproduction. And this has been compared to what uh, may happen with the outside vitrification, as you could uh, separate aging from reproduction, which is again a, a, a big uh, advancement in women's empowerment and women being able to make their own lives uh, plan. So uh, fertility preservation is one of the main indications, as we will see today, uh, for the outside vitrification. And, and it gives the chances to plan your life. It, you could plan not only maternity, you may postpone for later. You may plan avoiding OHSS by freezing eggs. You may plan your chemotherapy if it's uh, an oncological preservation. So there are many different indications that we will review today. Why, why considering outside vitrification to postpone maternity? And the main reason you can see here in this uh, slide is data coming from Eurostat, is data from Europe, showing uh, the mean age at first birth in women in, in the last few years. We have seen, especially in the south of Europe, where I live in Spain, how um, the age of the first pregnancy increases uh, almost um, every decade increases one year. So this is uh, non-stop since the 70s. And today we can see in the next graph, we can see how uh, mean age in general in Europe is uh, 29.5. But if you go down to Italy or, or Spain here in the, in the lower right hand corner, you can see that mean age at first pregnancy is 31.2, 31.4, which is incredibly high because this means that many, many women will struggle to have babies in the future. And the interesting thing, and not a very good thing, is that this trend of increasing keeps uh, maintaining for the last 30 years or so. It's, it's becoming higher and higher every year without any plateau or without any any vision in the future that this may um, stop at some point. So, uh, as we know, um, there are many different indications to, to reach this stage. Why, why women or why couples uh, decide to postpone maternity nowadays? Many times, uh, women are some kind of, of um, blame because they they are um, labeled as you know selfish and thinking on on their own uh, professional careers as the main reason to postpone maternity but this is not truth when you ask women and uh, there are, there's plenty of literature on this there's questionnaires done in in, in the u.s in israel in australia uh, you will see that the main reason why women decide to postpone maternity is number one the lack of partner so we see that most of women who come today to freeze their eggs, they don't have a partner or sometimes they have a partner, but they're not completely convinced that it's him that they want to, to father the child. So they, they prefer to freeze the eggs and, and make the decision later. So this is number one, lack of partner. Uh, relationships are becoming, I think, more difficult in, in the last few years, in the last um, 10 or 20 years. And society is changing and this is a reality. Sometimes the decision is made uh, because the relationship is becoming unstable or even a recent rupture. It's not unusual to see women who have been engaged in a relationship for eight or ten years. 
and then suddenly the relationship um, ruptures and, and they are maybe 36, 37, 38 and they need to start to find a new partner and then bring into the conversation the issue of having a baby. So this is not going to happen very quickly and this is why many of these women opt to freeze the eggs. There are some women that, yes, could be a temporary decision to, to stop for a while um, the maternity project and if they are finalizing university or doing a master's degree or, or trying to uh, climb a little bit in the professional ladder, they, they may choose this option and sometimes because they, they don't have the resources to, to raise a child at this moment and they opt for, for freezing uh, and, and be more stable in the future. The issue of vitrification completely changed the way we do this in the lab and this is why uh, before year 2004-2006 more or less egg freezing didn't work very well. Today it became the standard approach for oocyte cryopreservation, significantly more efficient uh, with, with this uh, vitrification technique and the main reason as you all know is that when you do slow freezing you have the risk of creating ice crystals inside of the cell. You know that the oocyte is a cell full of water and if you freeze water you will have ice crystals even if you use different solutions. With vitrification it's a combination of very high cryoprotectant concentrations in the cell combined with a, a very very fast um, freezing uh, temperature, so the very, very fast uh, decrease temperature. So if you really s uh, decrease the temperature at a very uh, fast pace, and at the same time you increase the concentration of cryoprotectants inside of the cytoplasm of the cell, you will avoid this formation of, of crystals, you will have a, um, a solution uh, that will avoid uh, the rupture of the cell and thus the survival rates will be significantly higher. This has uh, created a huge demand for fertility preservation and here you see in this paper that we published a few years ago how uh, there is a dramatic rise in the, in the demand for fertility preservation. In blue you can see the, the oncological uh, fertility preservation which is more or less stable because all the labs are offering this today and this is the demand for um, elective fertility preservation which keeps rising and here you have data uh, updated up to, to last year and you can see how this demand keeps increasing uh, every, every single year. If you look at the numbers you can see that demand was around 2% when we started in 2007. This demand is today over 22% of all the fertility preservation in, in our program. In this graph uh, you can see uh, uh, the, the profile of the patient that comes to freeze the eggs. Here you have uh, data from our, own, from our own program who come for elective fertility preservation. Most of these women are single, they have no partner, and the immense majority of them are heterosexual. And you can also see that usually the education level is, is pretty high, so these are usually uh, middle class women or upper class women uh, with uh, most of them with university degrees and, and not engaged in a relationship at the time of, of coming. Of course you can find all, all, all different profiles but in, in, in quantity this would be the, the average person. As you can see in, in this uh, graph again data coming from our program in this, in this paper that we published a few years ago you can see the results of 641 women who, who came back and 80 patients who returned to, to use these oocytes for, um, for pregnancy. The age of vitrification was uh, significantly older in women who did elective fertility preservation. This is a very interesting data because when you compare in, in this paper as we did patients who freeze the eggs for cancer or patients who freeze the eggs as elective social freezers, there's a big, big difference in the age of these women. Women uh, who freeze uh, because of cancer, they are significantly younger. Women, as you can see in this graph, who come for elective fertility preservation, as you can see, is 36.6. So 
uh, probably we would have much better outcome if these women came earlier, but this is the reality. Um, again, if you look at the storage time, more or less was around two years, so they were about to make a decision, but they took some time to make it. The time they came, they were almost 40 as a mean age. And you can see the survival rate um, is, um, is pretty good, even at, at these ages. You see it's almost 30 a year of, of mean age, survival rate around 84%. And when you look at the outcome of our clinical pregnancy rate and ongoing pregnancy rate, as you can see in tables, they have um, comparable outcomes to what would be in women who do these procedures with fresh uh, oocytes. And when you look at the cumulative live birth per patient, again, it was similar to what you might expect in, in patients who do these procedures in, in um, fresh cycles. When you take data, more recent data coming from Australia, you can see a trend for these patients to come a little bit younger, when they compare data, old data with new data, it seems that they seem to come a little bit earlier and, and the return rate seems lower. The problem with the return rate is that you have to give these women some time for them to make a choice because I agree that some of these women will never come back to, to use the eggs, but those who come, they, they won't come in, in one year. They may take one or two or even five years before they make the decision to come back. When we analyze this, uh, this data uh, um, up to last year, uh, 2023 today, in, in, in this particular year, we take data from December 2022, and this is consistent with our publication in 2018. We, we published um, around 5,000 patients. Today we have more than 14,000. At that time, 650 came back. Today, we have data of 200, to, sorry, 2,500 who came back. If you look at the mean age, it's slightly younger, as, as the Australians showed, where we can see uh, slightly uh, younger age. Not a big jump, but at least one and a half year, which is significant uh, when we try to consider offset quality. The return rate is slightly higher, so we see almost 20% of these women come back. Why? Because there's a higher, uh, a longer gap so uh, we're getting more and more patients back from those who froze. Survival rate is similar. Um, when we look at the clinical outcome, again, it's similar in terms of implantation rate and pregnancy rate, and especially cumulative live birth rate. So this means that the demand keeps increasing and the results remain consistent. We will review briefly what are the factors associated with success, what are the, the factors that may be linked to a to success after thawing, and we will review the time of storage, the morphology of the oocyte, uh, women age, which is crucial, the indication for this freezing, the number of oocytes freezing, and some technical aspects. When we analyze the survival rate, and, and this is data coming from our donor program, we can see that uh, there's no difference in the number of oocytes frozen, so it doesn't mean that if you get more oocytes, you will have a high survival rate. So some of these women uh, have a, a, a poorer response, some of us have a, a better response, but as you can see here in the, in, the, in the multivariate analysis, none of them is associated with success. You have data from uh, um, BMI or, or days of stimulation or, or um, amount of estradiol produced or progesterone at the end of the follicular phase. Again, the area under the curve means that in these arrow securities that there is no, no um, predictive value here. So no correlation between the response in the ovaries and the chances of survival. When we look at the time of storage, again, look at the survival rate, it remains stable, whether it was frozen for just a, a few months or a year or more than five years. So again, they don't lose quality. And this is a very common question from our patients. How long can I keep my eggs frozen? Well, we don't see any impact of, of freezing the eggs for one or two or five years. It's going to be exactly the same. If you look at this survival rate according to the storage time, whether these eggs come from elective fertility preservation freezing or whether it comes from cancer patients, again, there's absolutely no difference in, in the survival rate uh, according to the duration of the storage. One thing that is uh, extensively studied, but we have very little information, we have to say, is uh, what is the, the oocyte morphology impact on the, on the outcome. And, 
And again, patients will ask us, are, me, are my eggs of good quality? And we honestly do not know. We know if we freeze mature oocytes, but the quality will probably be detected at a later stage once they become fertilized. But the truth is that we do look at many, many different parameters. This is data from our group, again, from Evie, from uh, Dr. Coelho, and she look at different uh, morphologic aspects of the oocyte, uh, calling some of these oocytes, as you can see in the right-hand panel, dysmorphic oocytes. But when we look at the impact of these dysmorphic oocytes on the survival rate or on the blastulation rate or on the usable blastosis rate, it was absolutely comparable. You can see the odds ratio. It always crosses the unity, so that means that there's no significant impact on these dysmorphic oocytes on the survival rate. So, again, we cannot predict how these eggs will, will behave once we thaw them in the future, which is a relevant question, of course. Still... Uh, women come uh, at, at a later stage than we wish they could come and obviously we need to work a lot on this by raising awareness and, and, and increasing the, the knowledge in the society, not only among patients but in those women before they become patients so they can make decisions at the right time and not regret that they didn't come earlier. This is the mean age of women who came to free source sites for elective fertility preservation. You can see mean age is 37.2 but there are many women still coming, as you can see, at 39, 40, 41. We see women coming uh, to free sex even at 45 or 46, and they want to free sex for the future. And, and you question yourself, what future? Because it's way too late here. We, you explain to them, probably the probabilities of success are less than 1%, and, and they would argue, well, 1% is more than zero, so I want, I want to try. But it's probably useless to free sex at, at such late stage. If you take... Um, data updated to December 2022, again, it's so slightly lower. You can see that the, the trend is, is going backwards, uh, fortunately, but it's still, still way too late. I think, ideally, uh, I, I don't think we should freeze eggs in the early 20s, of course not, because most of these women will become pregnant by themselves. But probably in the, in the 30s, mid-30s, if you don't foresee to be a mother uh, uh, in, in a medium uh, term, probably it's not a bad idea to consider egg freezing. Because the consequences of ovarian age, and I think they're fully uh, well known by us as physicians and, and embryologists and scientists, but probably they're not so well known out there in the, in the lay public. And I think we need to educate the society to, to tell them that there's some time when fertility is easy, as you can see here in, in, in the left panel. There is uh, some time when fertility starts to decline very quickly, like in the 30s, mid-30s, and then in the 40s, as, as here, uh, this is the end of fertility. Having babies after 40 is not impossible, but it becomes extremely complicated. And if you have in the middle any surgery, ovarian surgery, endometriosis, even chemotherapy, all of these things will anticipate your time of menopause. And the reason why uh, it's difficult to have babies at, at, after the mid-30s is because aneuploidies rise exponentially. You can see in this... Uh, um, a very well-known paper from Jason Franasiak from uh, EVRMA in New Jersey. How you have a tremendous rise after 35 of these aneuploidies, and these will make embryos that some of them may even look really beautiful in the microscope, but internally we know they are aneuploid and they will never implant. If you look at the um, number of oocytes obtained and the number of mature oocytes vitrified, again, you will have a significant decrease with aging. You will see how women in in the late 30s or early 40s have significantly lower number of oocytes than if they did this procedure when they were younger. And similarly, this is the amount of um, cycles that a woman needs to do to uh, obtain a reasonable number of oocytes. So that means that um, you, if you're young, look, and you can see here in, in blue, light blue or in, in orange or in gray, how those bars in one or two or three cycles, they would have enough oocytes to do a, a treatment in the future if they need to do so. However, you see in dark blue or green how some of these women require more and more and more cycles because the response is significantly lower and they may need to do uh, many more rounds of, of ovarian stimulation and pickup to finally freeze a decent number of oocytes that will give them a reasonable chance to have a baby. If you look at the uh, clinical outcome, outcome again, 
age is, is very, very important. This data comes from our, our paper that we published in 2016 about elective fertility preservation. You can see how uh, women who freeze and, and, and use the eggs later, if they, um, th this is the survival rate that you can see here according to the time when they vitrified. So if they vitrified under 35, survival rate was significantly higher, 95% almost, versus 82% when women were 36 or beyond. And if you look at the uh, live birth rate, again, very nice outcome in young women, not so nice when we were, were, women were uh, 36 or beyond. Uh, you start to decline dramatically, as it happens in, in general IVF. If you stratify by different group of uh, ages, again, you can see here again, a very classical decline with aging in both survival rate as well and the life birth rate. And obviously this uh, becomes bigger uh, when you collect more data. This updated graph uh, from uh, this year, you can see how we have done um, a much larger sample size of patients. And again, uh, if women are younger, you, you will freeze more OSA, you will have more OSAs to work with because the survival rate, as you can see, is almost 10 points different. And when you translate this into the clinical pregnancy rate or ongoing pregnancy rate, again, you will have significantly better outcome with younger oocytes than if you postpone freezing um, until you are uh, 36 or beyond. Another interesting variable is uh, trying to understand <clears throat> if there's any difference in the outcome um, regarding the indication. So you can look at the um, not only at the sample size, which obviously is significantly bigger with, with uh, donors, but you can see also especially the survival rate and the cumulative live birth per patient. And this is what you could see with frozen eggs in donors. This is what you could see in, in elective fertility preservation in young and not so young patients. So you can see again how the results change dramatically from 68.5 to 26.8. When you go for, uh, to the results of poor responder patients, again, you can have young poor responders who actually have very good outcomes compared to not so young poor responders who do as most women do with advanced maternal age. A similar uh, data happens with cancer patients, even though the outcome in young patients was slightly lower than expected, to be honest, and we will elaborate a little bit on this later. And here you have data also from endometriosis patients. Again, a very good outcome in young patients, not so good in older patients, but it doesn't seem that endometriosis has a stronger impact. We will again show um, um, another graph uh, in a couple of seconds. So this is uh, the, the deeper analysis of um, patients with cancer. Here we analyze uh, women who came to use the oocytes after oncological fertility preservation we found uh, a, a lower survival rate and we found a slightly lower clean cumulative life birth rate per patient in cancer patients. And when we did uh, multivariate analysis with the logistic regression, we couldn't identify that the indication was significant. So then we, we did a similar analysis for the age and, and we couldn't say actually that the lower clinical outcome was because of the cancer disease. We failed to demonstrate that uh, and we failed to demonstrate that was, the cancer was implied uh, itself. We, we saw that there was age actually the factor directly related to the survival and, and cumulative life birth rate, as you can see in the p-values. As mentioned before, in endometriosis patients, it happens exactly the same. This is uh, data from um, an observational study. We, we have published uh, another recent paper on, on this topic, which is of uh, uh, extreme interest. Here we can see how women with endometriosis, when they freeze the eggs under 35, they have uh, a very nice survival rate and a very nice clinical pregnancy rate, actually comparable to what you could find in, in fresh IVF cycles. When women freeze the eggs at the later stage, when they have endometriosis, they have poorer outcomes. So it doesn't seem that the quality of the oocyte in these women is uh, very, very different. We, we will have lower number of oocytes, as we know. We know endometriosis mainly does a quantitative damage on the ovaries. And if you freeze a lower number of oocytes, you will have lower number of, embry of embryos and, as expected, a, a, a lower clinical outcome, but not because of the, the disease itself. Another interesting point was raised by, by Eric Foreman a few years ago. 
he uh, published this initial paper where it seemed that frozen eggs could yield a lower blastulation rate. And here you can see out of those um, oocytes that were underwent ICSI, uh, you can see the, the fertilization rate was slightly better with fresh, uh, the number of embryos slightly better with fresh. And then when you look at the total number of blastocysts or usable blastocysts, it seems that you do better with fresh than frozen. So we try to uh, replicate these findings and go farther uh, down in, the, in this analysis. And here in this graph, you can see uh, how the data uh, shows embryo quality according to the type of oocytes, whether it was fresh or frozen. This is the ASEVIR classification, which is the Spanish Embryology Society. And if you look at the numbers, they may seem different, but when, when you do uh, uh, combine statistics with logistic regression, we couldn't find a relationship between the type of oocyte and the percentage of usable blastocysts. So actually, we concluded that we could have a similar or comparable yield in both groups. Again, uh, data to, to have in mind because we will uh, investigate this further. Another way to evaluate the efficiency of, of elective fertility preservation is uh, looking at the, at the number of usable blastocysts. And this would be obviously the combination of transfer plus frozen. So we, we took a large database uh, from 2008 to 2022, and, and we look at a big number of patients, more than 55,000 patients using fresh oocytes versus more than uh, 1,500 who did uh, elective fertility preservation. Um, mean age was slightly different. Those who froze oocytes were um, slightly older, as you can see in the graph. Um, the percentage of usable blastocysts seemed to be slightly better with the fresh, probably related to the age of the patient. But then again, the, the number of patients with blastocysts in total was similar. And in fact, uh, you can see it's 63.8 versus 65.7, which gives non-significant differences. And, and doing the, the multivariate uh, regression analysis, trying to see why we have this difference here, we, we couldn't find that it was related to the type of oocytes. So in, 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 in a few words, we couldn't say that the lower amount of usable blastocysts was related to the issue that the oocytes were frozen. So this is what, what the regression uh, analysis told us. So it may be related maybe to the number of oocytes or maybe to the age of the patient rather than the fact that the oocytes could be frozen. We uh, added more variables to the equation, trying to understand if there was any explanation. And here again, we found a strongly significant association with the age at vitrification, as we might expect. You will, you will have more blastocysts uh, the younger you freeze these oocytes, as in fresh. Um, it was related to the number of inseminated oocytes. Obviously, the, the, the higher the number of oocytes, the higher the number of blastocysts you will end up getting. And obviously, whether the sperm came from ejaculated sperm or surgical extraction, or if there was a, a male factor, all of these factors contributed to the number of usable blastocysts altogether, rather than just the fact of being fresh or frozen. We move now into a, a very interesting area of, of um, number of oocytes to freeze. How many oocytes do I need to have a baby? And this is, again, a very, very common question for my patients. And today, there's plenty of data out there that you can use to counsel your patients. You have, uh, for example, this paper from uh, Doyle, published in FNS uh, in 2016. It's a very nice model uh, where they, they investigated the chances to have a baby or two babies or three babies in blue, red or green, depending on the age that you freeze your oocytes. And here you have in the upper left corner, uh, if you um, freeze 20 oocytes, for example, when you're 30 to 34, you have an 80% chances of having one baby. Uh, you have 50% chances of having two babies or 20% chances of having three babies. Very useful information. But if you happen to freeze 20 oocytes when you're 41, 42, and, and this is extremely unusual, by the way, women at 41, 42, they, most of them will not freeze, freeze 20 oocytes because they don't produce so many eggs. Uh, the chances reduce to 40%. So this is very, very important uh, data. And in fact, uh, it's, it's important to remember that the, the, the oocytes becoming babies 
uh, after 35, it's really low. The number of um, women or patients may think that if I freeze five oocytes, I have five potential babies. But remember that it's around 6.4% the number of oocytes that make babies at home, so not, not very high. Another model is this one from Goldman, coming from um, um, a group in Harvard in 2017, published in HR. Again, similar data, you freeze 20 oocytes in, in, uh, in a donor, you have 96, 98% chance of having a baby. If, if you happen to be a patient under 35, this uh, percentage is still very high. However, if you are 42, the chance is reduced to 37%. So again, we have to use this data because speaking in generic terms of ideal oocytes from donors may create false expectations and, and, and this is the worst thing we can do with our patients. We have data good enough to be realistic. We have even our own uh, model, uh, our own um, figure uh, created with our own data where we plotted the cumulative probability of live birth after elective fertility preservation or even after oncological fertility preservation. So according to the number of oocytes consumed, how many um, babies we could get also related to the age of the patient. As you can see uh, in in, um, in green, you can see uh, women over 35. In blue, women younger than 35. And, and you have the, the data plotted in the graph. Again, if you are young when you freeze and you have 10 oocytes frozen, you have a, a, around 43% chance of having a baby. However, these 10 oocytes will be only 25% chances of success if you were over 35. If you have 20 oocytes under 35, very nice cumulative live birth rate but 20 oocytes uh, beyond 35 will make babies only half of the patients. Again, this is real data that we can use to counsel our patients. We also found that this is true for other populations as cancer patients or even women with endometriosis. Um, the problem with endometriosis, as we all know, is that we may get less oocytes. And here you have in the right-hand panel how women with endometriosis have a lower response and, and even lower when women are over 36. So compared to elective fertility preservation, we might expect that clinical outcome could be slightly different. Here you have a, a recent paper from 2021 from our group, uh, trying to show again the, the clear impact of aging. And, and you can see uh, again uh, this example done in women with endometriosis. Uh, I think this is graph is, is very useful in that term because um, again, you can have very similar outcome, not related to endometriotic disease, but related to the age of the patient. You can, you can see the number needed to freeze, which is the, the ideal question. And we can see that young endometriosis women can achieve the same outcome as, as social freezers if they have the same number of oocytes. So this is extremely reassuring because many of these women with endometriosis may think that because they have endometriosis, they could have or they could expect a poorer outcome. And if we look to the other side of the coin, uh, this is also extremely interesting because sometimes when you have uh, a low number of oocytes frozen, the probability of not reaching an embryo transfer is, is high. And I think this, again, is extremely useful to counsel our patients. So we can have a, a, a patient or a colleague of ours asking, you know, I have this woman at 37, she has frozen um, eight oocytes. Is that enough to reach an embryo transfer always? And we know that with eight frozen oocytes, for example, at 37, uh, there's a risk of 27% of not reaching an embryo transfer, not even not getting pregnant, but not being able to do an embryo transfer. So I think this uh, information is very, very important and, and extremely interesting to understand what are the realistic chances of, of any given patient of, of um, reaching an embryo transfer or, or not reaching an embryo transfer if you freeze eggs when you are at advanced maternal age and you have a very low number of oocytes. So finally, to conclude, Mr. Chairman, I think we all agree that age is the most relevant factor impacting success after oocyte vitrification. We know that the number of vitrified oocytes is strongly related with cumulative live birth rate. In some cases, it is recommended to do more than one cycle as we have, as we have seen. Survival failure or poor embryo quality may happen unexpectedly and, and we cannot predict this even by, by carefully looking at the morphology of the oocytes. 
We know today that even uh, there are new algorithms um, that through AI are trying to identify this, but there's still, uh, still a lot of work needs to be done on this. Clinical outcome may vary depending on the indication of fertility preservation. In this particular case, it, it may be true the more the better, so the higher the number of oocytes, the higher of number of blastocysts we may have, and obviously the higher the chances of cumulative life birth rate. I think patients should avoid general counseling. We, we should focus on individualized uh, counseling based on the evidence that is already published out there. I think we need to educate women and, and the society in general, especially at the very young ages, probably at schools. Women should be aware, but also males, boys should be aware that uh, what is the impact of, of age on their fertility and the potential of having babies with their partners and not wait too long either to have the baby or to freeze the eggs if they, if they need to do so. So our main role is basically to inform. And very important, we should manage expectations adequately. Uh, this is not the maternity insurance. We're not freezing, um, actually, we're not preserving fertility. We're freezing gametes. These gametes need to fertilize and then need to implant. So we cannot guarantee by freezing eggs that they may have a baby in the future. We, we try to avoid as much as possible false expectations based on general counseling. I think individualized counseling is key always, and especially in this particular topic based on, on published evidence. Thank you very much.